Hey Sub Furies, fantasy stories are known for a lot of things, vague, often contrived prophecies, gallant, amazingly gifted, chosen one heroes with no parents because they're inconvenient for the plot, and lots and lots of mythical races. But arguably, the thing that really sets fantasy apart from other genres is magic. Its role in the world you create, how characters can use it to solve problems, and the problems it can create. Oftentimes a really unique magic system is what sets one fantasy story apart from another. In writing your fantasy novel, something to think about is how hard or soft you want your magic system to be. Now we have to thank our lord and saviour of hard magic systems, Brandon Sanderson, for popularising the terms hard and soft, but what do they mean? This video will be delving deep into hard magic systems, so I'll only be lightly touching on what a soft magic system is. But broadly speaking, soft magic systems often have a vague, undefined, or mysterious set of rules and limitations to being used. If you like fantasy, then you've definitely seen this in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Everyone knows Gandalf can do wizardy things with his pointy hat and his staff, but when it comes down to the specific limitations of what he can and can't do, Gandalf tends to skimp on the details. A hard magic system, on the other hand, has clearly defined rules, consequences, and limitations that govern what one can or cannot do with magic. That your hero can use telekinesis, but they can only use it on things they could realistically lift themselves, and the things have to be within 10 meters of them. A great example of a hard magic system is Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which if you haven't seen, has amazing characters, world building, and story structure. If you enjoyed Avatar The Last Airbender, there's a good chance you might enjoy that. In Full Metal, they call magic alchemy, and it's governed strictly by the law of equivalent exchange, which trust me you'll get to know very well as you watch the series because they repeat it at the start of every single episode. It is impossible to create something out of nothing. If one wishes to obtain something, something of equal value must be given. This is the law of equivalent exchange. For example, Alphonse transforms all of the pieces of a broken radio into a working radio. All of the pieces are there, they just have to be put in the right place and order in order to work again. Alchemy never ever breaks that first rule. The viewer knows pretty well what the characters can or can't do in any given circumstance. Now, your story can have a magic system that is anywhere on the spectrum from soft to hard, and both styles have their merits and limitations for different kinds of stories, but let's talk about hard magic today. Sanderson wrote essays on what he calls his three rules of magic, but the most important one for hard magic systems is the first. An author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. Writing is all about how you set up problems and conflicts and how they are resolved in a way that makes for a good story. If we have no idea what Gandalf can do and he just solved every problem the Fellowship has with random, unseen before magical spells and moments of tension, then it wouldn't be a satisfying resolution. It feels like the author is just writing, A WIZARD DID IT! and expecting you to be happy with a clear deus ex machina. Sticking to Sanderson's first rule in hard magic systems means the reader understands what characters can or can't do, their capabilities, and are always thinking about how magic can be used to solve problems within those strict rules that you laid out. Magic becomes a defined tool that doesn't feel cheap to use because it's not screaming, how is it did it, at the reader. It's the character's experience, intelligence, and ingenuity that allows them to solve problems. Readers can feel cheated by soft magic because it's much harder to predict where it can be used or what it can do, but hard magic allows the reader to feel much more a part of the story, aligning themselves with the characters as they earnestly predict how magic could be used in any given circumstance. In Avatar The Last Airbender, and forgive me for using it as the benchmark for all things good and holy in writing, but it is, the bending magic system is relatively hard. It's not all that mysterious, with the exception of an occasional new alternate bending style thrown in, and the rules are relatively clear. It's established numerous times throughout the series that water can be bent from a variety of sources. It doesn't just have to be water flowing in a river, say, but you can bend it from trees, vines, and even human blood. So it's a logical and satisfying conclusion to have Katara escape prison by water bending her body sweat. The viewer could have figured it out just as Katara did. After all, the human body is full of water. But how do you actually design a hard magic system? Firstly, you have to keep in mind its predictability. Typically, the harder your magic system, the more specific you have to be about its rules and consequences. Soft magic can be 
mysterious and unpredictable, but your hard magic system really does need a level of predictability, or at least an internal consistency, that if our gallant hero with his suave look and 11 inch wand does magical action X, he can expect magical consequence Y. Now this doesn't mean that your hard magic can't have the possibility of disastrous or unpredicted consequences should the magic go horribly wrong, but it does mean that those unpredictable effects will often come from the character's lack of knowledge, mistake or misuse of the intended magic, not because the magic is inherently unpredictable. Once again my baby Fulmir Alchemist demonstrates this perfectly when an attempt to bring someone back from the dead creates a ghoulish monster and destroys Alphonse's entire physical body, not because the magic itself was unpredictable, but because they didn't understand the law of equivalent exchange, the rule that governs all alchemy. While Sanderson didn't say this explicitly, I do feel that the guidelines for designing hard magic systems are best encompassed fundamentally in his essay The Second Law of Magic. Limitations are more important than powers. If you want to read it in more detail, there's a link down in the description below to it. Seems pretty simple, right? That Harry Potter's magic is limited because he can only cast spells when he has a wand. Though later on we do learn that wandless magic is a thing for like level 99 wizards with really cool hats. Hard magic systems often boil down to three things, their limitations, weaknesses, and costs. These essentially create the rules your magical characters have to obey. What limits are there on their powers? Can your suave hero mind control people, but only as long as they can see them and they're naked? The most common form of limitation is a vaguely defined limit of strength or training or mental acumen of the practitioner. Avatar The Last Airbender is kind of like this. There's no explicit limit to how much fire a person can conjure or how strong a wind they can muster, but we know it's kind of limited by their training, willpower, strength and talent. Think of it as the rule of there's only so much awesome one human can handle. If you're really trying to differentiate your hard magic system from this common trope, then think about not relying on this particular limitation, but maybe something else. Perhaps certain powers can be negated or are affected by certain things in the environment around them, like the moon, certain plants or minerals. That way your magician has to be aware of their surroundings at all times, or it can be used against them by their enemies. Secondly, weaknesses. Weaknesses in magic systems can create interesting dynamics in a story where magic would usually make a character a lot more powerful than those around them. Maybe they can transform into a werewolf at will, but that makes them vulnerable to silver bullets. Though, once again, making these limitations to your magic too simple can be uninteresting. Don't just give your super suave hero with fantastic hair and gorgeous eyes a kryptonite factor that completely incapacitates them. If if you have multiple different powers in your story, it could be interesting to have the use of one power making them more vulnerable to another, so your character has to be cautious about using their powers around someone who could take advantage of that. At its heart, I personally feel that the best magic systems are designed in such a way that it affects the way that the characters think or their world operates. Finally and thirdly, perhaps the most common way that people create rules for their magic system is through magic costing something. Fulmir Alchemist requires the exact materials to turn X into Y. Water, 35 liters. Carbon, 20 kilograms. Ammonia, 4 liters. Lime, 1.5 kilograms. Phosphorus, 800 grams. Salt, 250 grams. In a lot of series, the magician requires certain materials for their spell or enchantment. Bone of the father, unwillingly given. Flesh, the servant. Willingly sacrificed blood of the enemy forcibly <laughs> taken. In Harry Potter, this ritual had costs in terms of ingredients as well as the way the ingredients had to be acquired. But perhaps the most common magical cost is that of bodily energy. In the Wheel of Time and the Inheritance Cycle, doing something with magic exhausts you. Which is fine until you try and be too magically heroic and you overdose on magical heroin and die. Magic causing fatigue is so common because it's an easy way to separate the strong from the weak. A powerful magician doesn't flinch as she vanquishes an army, while a weak one collapses from trying to zap a fly. It it allows for a lot of wiggle room for the author, because you can make it so that your hero has just enough energy to do impressive magical thing X without much more justification than a short training montage beforehand. But you've got to be careful about how you use this cost, because it can come across as cheap if your hero is suddenly doing things that they couldn't before, or the exhaustion factor is so inconsistent that it's not really a cost at all. That magical thing X exhausts them just enough when the story requires them to succeed, but magical thing Y is a little too much when the story requires them to fail. 
we've already talked about how hard magic systems require a level of predictability and consistency, and the exhaustion cost can challenge that predictability and suspension of belief if not used wisely. One of my favourite examples of a magical cost is actually from one of the softest fantasy magic systems, in A Song of Ice and Fire. In that, Beric Dondarrion is brought back to life dozens of times using magic, and it changes him. George R. R. Martin described it as such, my characters who come back from death are worse for wear. In some ways, they're not even the same characters anymore. The body may be moving, but some aspect of their spirit has changed or transformed, and they've lost something. Coming back from the dead costs Beric Dondarrion something of himself, what precisely we're never told, but it's visible in the character in his books. Pieces of you get chipped away. Look for unique ways to make your magic cost if you want to distinguish your magic system from others. Maybe manipulating the element of earth causes plants to die around you. The ramifications of these effects could be widespread and fascinating to explore, if this kind of magic was common, would it be outlawed to protect the crops and forests? Interestingly, both Avatar and Harry Potter have very little cost in terms of their magic. The exhaustion that the Avatar characters experience seems to be primarily from the physical exercise they get doing what essentially amounts to martial arts, and while we do see that it requires effort at certain points, exhaustion never plays the large cost-like role that we see in The Wheel of Time or The Belgariad, where overusing magic can kill you. Likewise, casting spells in Harry Potter very rarely seems to draw on the strength of the caster. There are vague lines in the books that refer to powerful spells requiring powerful magic, but it really acts as a true cost to the witch or the wizard. The reason for this in both series, I think, is that their magic systems are restricted heavily by limitations rather than cost. Bending is limited pretty strictly by ability and practice, while magical ability is limited by knowledge and skill. Where the limitations in your hard magic system create strong enough rules for your characters, for that predictability that you need, it may not be necessary to have a large cost. Likewise, if the cost of your magic is large, it may not be necessary to have strict limitations. It really just depends on which kind of rules you want your hard magic system to rely on. Finally, style. You need to pick a style for your hard magic system. System, and this can be a lot of fun. Typically speaking, hard magic systems need to be more specific about this than soft magic. Maybe you want a theurgical magic system where your characters channel the power of gods, angels, and demons. Or maybe they need special magical devices like various items of glamorous jewelry, or it requires blood and sacrifice. Or maybe they're tapping into the ubiquitous force that permeates everything and everyone conveniently. I often find that writers focus on designing the style of their magic system more than the other parts we talked about before. And while it's a lot of fun to design the aesthetics of it, it's the predictability, limitations, weaknesses, and costs that will play into the conflicts, problems, and character interactions of the story the most. But of course, as I always say, there's no right way to write, and it's all up to how you feel that you work best. These guidelines will work for some people, and they won't work for others. This is going to be a three-part writing series on magic systems, and next time I want to talk to you about soft magic systems, how to design them, and their place in your fictional, fantastical world. I hope this helped, and if if it did, please give it a like and leave me a comment down below. My question of the day is, what is your magic system like? How would you design one? If you like what I make, please consider supporting me on Patreon for as little as $1. Uh, you can get uh, early videos as well as plenty of other perks. In the meantime, come follow me on Twitter, Wattpad, Facebook, email me stuff you've made at the address or links in the description below. That is all from me today. Stay nerdy, Subfuries. I will see you in the future.